lava tubes. We talk a lot about how interesting and fascinating lava tubes will be to explore on other worlds. They're places that are protected from the harsh conditions on the surface. They could give a glimpse into times when there might have been life on Mars. They might be the great places to put a habitat on a place like the moon or Mars. But also just exploring caves is a way to bring out the ability of a team to put astronauts into challenges there where they have to face and problem solve and work together. And it brings out the best and the worst of people who will need to depend on each other when they travel to another planet. So my guest today is Francesco Sauro, who is from the University of Bologna. He's with the European Space Agency and leads teams of astronauts and researchers and geologists into caves, both to think about what we might find in other worlds, but also how to become better teammates for exploration. It's a fascinating conversation, kind of makes you want to go and explore some caves now. So here you go. Enjoy. So are you claustrophobic at all? How do you feel in tight spaces? Mm, no, of course not. Uh, I cannot say that I'm claustrophobic. Otherwise, I would not go into caves. But I, I can say that the, there is a big difference between uh, a closed environment like an artificial environment and uh, a cave because a cave it's can, can be kilometers long so it's it's yes it's a closed environment but in a different way i i'm not claustrophobic at all and i've done some caving and when i'm in a big cavern and stuff it's fine but as soon as you have to go through these really tight bends, you know, through little crevices and stuff, it, it really does freak me out. Like, I feel like I'm going to get stuck, but I, yeah, but uh, this is, this is quite normal. I mean, uh, to have fear of a very narrow place. Uh, also, I have fear of, of a very narrow place, but of course it, it's all a matter of, uh, knowing what you do and, uh, knowing the environment and then you can overcome the fear and, and, and right. go. Yeah, like, you know, you can fit if you get your head through, yeah, you, exactly. you know, you can, you know, well, you can fit. Or maybe you just know that there is some someone going to help you if you get stuck. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So why are lava tubes and caves so interesting for space exploration? Okay. There are two reasons. Um, I would say the first reason, which is, I think the most relevant is the fact that uh, we don't know anything about, uh, the subsurface, uh, and caves in other planets, like on the moon and on Mars. We know that there should be caves. Actually, there are for sure caves. And uh, we know the entrances, but we still don't know what is hidden out there. And especially for Mars, this is very, very interesting for astrobiology because uh, we could find something um, uh, related to extraterrestrial life because they are sheltered environments much better than the surface and so on. So this is the first reason which is more scientific. Uh, let's say to search for something that we still have to discover below the surface of the planets. And the other reason it's more related to the fact that caves um, are analog environments to, uh, let's say, space habitats or stations uh places where you are far from home uh uncomfortable where you have to be independent so there are a lot of analogies that could be used uh for training astronauts for future space travels right so i guess let's let's take these one at a time so first let's talk about just this this idea of it being an, an analog location um like what are the what are the stuff like when you go into a cave and you are exploring what are the kinds of challenges that you're facing that that an astronaut would nod and go yeah that i've i've been there too yeah there are many aspects so there are many stress stressors uh, that you have to face um for example uh, the distance from the surface so just to to let you understand better when we we do caving or cave exploration we talk about um the relative distance, meaning if you go in a cave uh, for 12 hours and you continue down to 1000 meters below the surface, there is no any mean of, means of transport to bring you out quickly. 
So the only way it's uh, by your body uh, climbing ropes and uh, going through squeezes for hours and hours. So you are much farther distance from your normal life, from safety, from your safe heaven than being on the space station. Because on the base, the space station, basically, you can, uh, if if you have an emergency, you can just uh, jump on the Soyuz or on on the on the Dragon and and then come back in few hours. There are caves which are much farther in terms of relative distance, and this has a psychological impact, which is very important to be managed, and is similar to what an astronaut could feel when will be on a space a ship uh, traveling toward Mars, maybe one week, one month away from any possible return to the Earth. So I think this is the first very relevant thing. The other is that anyhow caves are alien environment because there is no light. Uh, it's different from the surface. Everything is uh, uh, different from what you are used to. So we have to deal with an environment which is also dangerous. Uh, it's uncomfortable, the temperature could be low, could be extremely high, depends on the type of a cave. Um, and uh, we have limited resources. So uh, all, all this is very similar to what happens in space exploration. So we have to adapt to this environment and to monitor the environment. We have to be sure that we are not doing any mistake. And, and this is the same as a yeah. space I mean, I, I watched the drama about the the divers who rescued the soccer team in in thailand and and it definitely it feels like you could watch that and apollo 13 side by side and see a very similar scenario that people are trapped they need help it's a really bizarre environment that we and and requires novel solutions that have never been thought before and great risk yes it is it is because um, as, as the people, the astronauts in Apollo were very far, basically they had to be independent, but with the support from ground, uh, also in a cave, if something like this happened, um, the crew has to survive, has to find a way to survive. And then eventually someone with the same experience or, or let's say uh, someone that is able to manage this environment will try to, to rescue them out, but it takes long days, weeks. Um, and so all the, the effort is huge. Uh, it's, it's really similar. I think that uh, Apollo 13 and the, the, the Thailand uh, story uh, can be described as two of the most incredible rescue of all mm -hmm. time together. I have yeah. no doubt for one in space and one in the depth of the earth. So, and are there like, I know, I know you've done ice caves, you've done lava tubes, rock, you know, limestone caverns. Is there an environment that you think is most appropriate, especially if you want to train astronauts? So I think that, uh, um, of course, uh, um, let's say lava tubes are, uh, be a very good environment because they are very similar to what could be really on the moon. But uh, on the other hand, to really train uh, uh, an astronaut to, to be a space explorer, to be an explorer, uh, classical karst cave systems, uh, very long, like uh, tens of kilometers, hundreds of meters depth, uh, of depth uh, are the best because really you can face uh, uh, this uh, series of uh, difficult situations and, uh, and, and you are facing the unknown most of the time because you don't know what you will find just turning the corner and, or descending down a shaft or choosing a passage rather than another. And, and especially you, you need to stay in the cave for, for days to really feel the experience of, um, of exploration. Uh, let's say that uh, this usually is feasible in karstic caves, long cave systems uh, in the Alps, uh, but many places. I mean, in the U.S., there are many like Mammoth Cave, mm -hmm. uh, Karlsbad, and many, many others. So uh, lava tubes usually are shorter or let's say less complex. They are good analog of real environments on other planets. Um, ice caves are so dangerous that you cannot stay 
for long. Uh, and uh, it's more an analogy to an emergency situation where you have to really monitor whatever is going around you and to have to react very fast uh, to any uh, potential risk. So, so it's a little bit different kind of analogy. Yeah. Um, and, and it must be interesting, like, like if you take a team, like a team who's maybe going to go to Mars and they're going to depend on each other for six months or a year on the surface of Mars, and they're going to come up with problems and challenges that nobody could have predicted a cave system working together. I mean, you have to repel each belay each other. You have to, uh, work and solve problems. It does feel like it will bring out the best or the worst of everybody and reveal it as a team here on earth where you, yeah, you know, it's closer. Yeah, it's correct. Um, being in a cave as a team, uh, force every person to face, uh, fears, uh, uncertainties, uh, different characters, different cultures uh, and way of, uh, let's say, overcoming difficulties. So, of course, uh, doing these kind of activities in a cave, it's always a good way uh, to to be, I would say, naked, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and then and then all these problems should be solved and and find a balance between the people. Uh, which of course has the same objective. So, so every people in the team usually has the objective of explore, exploring, and uh, and this is the good thing. You know, if you have the same objective, then you will find a balance uh, to between uh, the bad and the good things of the people and the uh, abilities or 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 let's say uh, um, lack of any uh, com competency on, on a field or or so on or character, as, as I said. So. It is, uh, you never go in a deep cave with someone that you don't trust. Um, uh, but also, uh, before trusting someone, you need really to be in a, in a difficult environment. So it's kind of, of the two things together. You have to experience first your team, and then when you find a balance in your team, you can really do the big things. And um, this is what happens in caves. And for space, for sure, we cannot send people that have not uh, experienced it before this balance. I mean, they have to find it before here on Earth. And then uh, uh, when they are in space, it will be already uh, very efficient and very pleasant and very, uh, let's say, working uh, very well. So it's very useful. And all yeah. the astronauts recognize that it's very useful to be under stress and to, um, let's say, face this kind of uh, problems uh in advance that's really interesting i i never thought about it to that extent how it is like this really useful place to reveal the personalities of the people involved and to and to demonstrate because you're always looking for like you want to stretch but you don't want to break you want exactly. to come up with places where you can can test yourself without hurting yourself. Yeah. And it's really tricky to find that that balance. And it doesn't I, mean, I think about it, like I think about what I mentioned early on, like me going through these tight spaces, I would definitely go, I don't want to do this anymore. And, yeah. and yet, you know, I can, add, I can add one thing also, which is about self confidence. No, you know, um, most of the astronauts uh, are very experienced people, uh, maybe working in uh, aviation pilots, uh, someone a medical doctor someone uh, was working in the military so they 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 are used to face uh, quite scary things and complex things but uh, i would say very few extremely few of them have ever experienced it before cave exploration so this bring everybody to the same level uh, and bring everybody to face the same difficulties for the first time uh, which is which is uh, very very relevant. Also, uh, in, in caves, uh, there are many an other analogs that could do the same. For example, um, scuba diving, uh, or or even uh, you know uh, NASA is, uh, is is sending the astronauts to the knoll training the outdoor leadership. Uh, but let's say the caves are quite stronger, uh, and also in a cave you can speak 
a lot and uh, and and really reveal a personality which is something that is maybe more difficult if you have to do a diving expedition because you know communication is not so easy so there are many aspects that i think are complementary but caves are a very good place that's to do really it. great so let's talk about caves as interesting places to explore on other worlds what and what kinds of less or what kinds of discoveries do you think can be made exploring say lava tubes on the moon or mars so on the moon uh, um, it's very interesting because we have lava tube in the maria we know that they are there and uh, and we know that most probably they are much bigger than on earth based on surface of survey observations and also on radar observations so it is interesting because it's the only way we can really uh, descend to a sequence of lavas on the moon and study the geological history of the maria uh, which is related to the the history of the moon takes deep samples and uh, and then also potentially find a place which is good for uh, a base planetary base for the astronaut so this is for the moon for Mars it is a little bit different because we know that uh, the condition of the surface of Mars were very similar to Earth in the early history of Mars. So if there was life on Mars, microbial life, um, the only way to survive when the climate changed and the condition of the surface changed is to go underground and find uh, uh, shelter in caves uh, where there is no UV radiation, where the temperature discussion are are smoother, and so and and where there is almost, almost for sure water. So the the this is the big question uh, when we send a rover to Mars. The big question is: uh, Are we sending it to the right place, at the surface of the planet, or maybe it is just a, a place where we will see if there was life in the past, but. Uh, we will not get any information about potential life now. The only place is caves. And uh, and I think that there is the need to make a big shift in the space community to understand that we live on a planet that is an exception compared to uh, many other planets on the solar system, probably outside. On Earth, the best, uh, let's say, life uh, uh, boundaries are on the surface. But in most of the other planets, the best uh, life boundaries are underground. So let's put those two together then. We've got the the complexities and the challenges and the extreme situation of being of exploring a cave, but now you're doing it on another planet. That sounds like one of the hardest things multiplied by one of the hardest things, which by definition has got to be just extremely hard. So when you think about exploring a cave on the moon or mars what additional things do you think about yeah it is really really a uh, hard uh, extreme endeavor as you say uh, because uh, you are on another planet and then you are even in a cave so it's both things <laughs> together is really hard in fact uh, if you speak with uh, a lot of space engineers not even to the astronauts. I would say that the astronauts are, are enthusiastic about the idea <laughs> because they yeah. are adventurers and they like uh, uh, this kind of uh, effort. But uh, uh, if you speak to an engineer, then uh, he will tell you that you are crazy to think that anything could uh, work. Actually, it is true. It's very complicated, especially to have a rover uh, entering a cave or any robotic system. Uh, because of lack of uh, power, solar power, of, of uh, the terrain. Uh, it is something that anyhow uh, could be done for maybe a few hours or a few days. So it's not impossible uh, at all. It it's just requires a different uh, approach. Uh, but of course, uh, it is true that uh, the real exploration of this case will, will happen when humans will be able to go there. Um, because we know that humans uh, are much more flexible. And, and it's cave exploration on Earth that tell us this, because uh, uh, there are no rovers, no robots that are really able to explore caves on Earth. Right. Uh, it's just uh, on humans. So, so this is the, the main, um, yeah, 
when I mean, I, th I mean, I think about like rappelling down the entrance, but now you're doing it in a spacesuit. I think about trying to get access to power to keep your equipment running, but there's no, as you say, there's no solar energy. So you're having to run and maintain some kind of power system into the cave to be able to, to do this. And, and I'm sure there's like getting additional supplies down there so that you can eat yeah. and drink and swap out your oxygen. Like it just sounds the logistics just get insane. Yes. Okay. So then let's talk about like lava tubes and, and caves as useful places to live. If we do set up a, a research station on the moon or Mars, do you think that they make the, the, the best places for a long-term habitat in space? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is one of the hypotheses. Mm, of course, before to say uh, that I can tell to you, yes, it is the best, we have to go there and, and check. But if they look uh, uh, similar to what we have on Earth, and especially on Mars, uh, you could have even very good uh, grounds uh, with uh, aeolian sand and inside the tubes then uh, it could be very good places to pressurize uh, quite easy and uh, and let's say to build an habitat with a much less material than what we will need on the surface also the temperature imagine about the power budget of a of a base uh, even on the moon or on mars that has to sustain temperature differences between day and night which are huge so, um, uh, let's say cooling uh, during day, uh, heating during night. Uh, then if you have an environment which is uh, around 30 degrees uh, Celsius all the year round, then you overcome a huge problem. And uh, we know that uh, uh, some caves in some latitudes on the moon and Mars have this characteristic for hmm. sure. And so even on the moon, which we yes. know goes to like plus 100 Celsius yeah. and then minus 100 Celsius, depending on whether it's day or night, you're actually seeing yes. reasonable temperatures. Yeah. Because I know like, like here, like when I went into a cave system, you feel this cool air coming out. It was like four degrees Celsius yeah, you, all usually the time. It's, it's the average uh, of the year temperature of the place, even here on earth. So if you go to a high top, a high mountain, then you will have uh, two degrees Celsius. If you go to the to the Amazon, you can have uh, twenty five degree. Okay, so it depends on the average temperature. The same is on the Moon and Mars. So it, it is uh, very similar to the average temperature. So it moves uh, very strongly, ch changes in temperature uh, between day and night. Uh, and we know there are models, thermal models that shows that also on the moon, we could have temperatures uh, very comfortable inside the tube. There are other problems uh, that are related to the access because sometimes the, the pits that uh, allow the access to the caves uh, are of circular shape. So they can be um, uh, experiencing more heat because of, they are more exposed to the sun. So we know that in some cases we could overcome 300 degrees Celsius on the moon. Uh, so, uh, but as soon as you are in the tube itself, in the cave, then the temperature are, are smooth. And ESA has been doing a lot of research in this field for quite a while. I mean, there's the Pangea project and I've been, we've been reporting a lot on, on Universe Today about, about this work. But a lot of it seems very theoretical up into this point practice for what the future may hold. When do you think that we'll see something actually take place in space, be it a robotic exploration of a cave or, or humans going to a cave? What do you think? When do we see this in, in practice? I, I think that uh, uh, we are in a good time, let's say, because of course now with the Artemis program and space, uh, uh, let's say interest and research is growing. Uh, and um, the return of uh, men and women uh, to the moon will be uh, a big endeavor uh, in terms of technology, but will also leave a big heritage again in terms of technology and possibilities. So I think that uh, 
uh, we will be able to get a, a, a probe, a rover, a probe to a lunar pit in the next 20 years. It's my hope uh, because, um, let's say, the technology, there are different groups which are working on this technology. Probably you, you, you knew about the Moon Diver project from uh, JPL. Uh, we have been working in uh, in um, in uh, ESA with uh, some uh, uh, cave robot studies uh, like Daedalus. There are different technologies that could uh, afford this effort. And if you think about it, uh, in terms of science, you can do still a lot on the surface of the moon or taking samples or studies, the composition, a lot of things. But in terms of, um, uh, let's say, general public understanding and the emotional aspects of the exploration, going to the moon will look very similar uh, to what we have done so far. And, uh, and so we need to find something more challenging, something that will show to us something completely new. Mm -hmm. And caves are an opportunity to do that on the moon. So, so imagine uh, what uh, ESA has done with the Rosetta mission. No, uh, why it was so a huge success. It was something completely new. They went to a comet. Uh, the same will be for caves because people will, will look at it and will say, my God, so on the moon, there are so gigantic caves. What look this photo, it is a completely different environment from the photo that we are used from the Apollo. And I think this is still not well understood by space agencies, the potential in terms of uh, uh, public resonance and people being really surprised and emotionally surprised. I can tell also that on Mars it could be even uh, easier because uh, with ingenuity, uh, we demonstrated that we can use drones. So, so there we could have even bigger opportunities. So maybe a mission to a lunar uh, Martian pit in 30 years is something that uh, is feasible. Actually, I think it's very feasible. Uh, I mean, I think about the Ingenuity helicopter. And if you just dropped one of those right at the edge of one of the Mars pits, then it could start to make tiny little flights down into the yes. pit and then back up and then down into the pit and then back it's up. Like, and I wonder if the air density down in the pit would be higher and maybe help with the, with maybe, the flights. Maybe, maybe a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so I wonder if there's like a, like a quick hack that you could just send one yeah. of these little helicopters right to the edge of one of these pits on a CubeSat mission or something yeah. and then, and then get, and get to work. So the, you know, we've talked about rock caves, but you know, some of the most interesting places to search for life in the solar system is under the ice on places like Europa and yeah. Enceladus. And that's the third class of caves you've been talking about. These ice caves are very dangerous. Do you think that there are ice cave systems on places like Europa and Enceladus? Yeah, it, it depends on uh, the significance of the word caves. Uh, there, there are people that are claiming that uh, below Europa, a frozen surface that could be the biggest cave of the of the solar system, which is a huge <laughs> cavern full of water, you know. So it's an ocean in reality, but it's still uh, closed over the surface. So, so for sure, there are caves uh, uh, also in icy bodies. Uh, we know because also in the in the 67P comet uh, observed by Rosetta, there were repeat entrances. Um, so there are cavities. Of course, it's a different type of cave that require completely different technologies, completely different approach. Not explorable probably by humans, most of them at least. So it's more um, in, into the field of a, a robotic challenge, uh, which puts together technologies which are related to underwater challenges to cave challenges. In fact, uh, you know, it's <laughs> like another about, multiplier, isn't it? Yeah, you know, probably about the Bill Stone uh, uh, projects to, to drill through the eyes of mm -hmm. Europa and and um, and he is, in fact, a caver, but also a diver. So, in fact, he has this vision of, uh, of the two things, of the complexity of the two things. So it is really a much bigger challenge, I think. Uh, but let's say that when we will see what we have um, on, on the moon and on Mars, maybe we could have the, the interest and the curiosity then to push uh, uh, the effort of humanity also to, to really go through 
one of these uh, these uh, ice uh, bodies and and see below the crust like, like here on earth we have you know we have lots of mountains where i am in canada and we get these situations where the snow falls down the side of a mountain piles up at the base of it and then the water percolates through it and you get these ice caves which you absolutely should not go inside because they are extremely dangerous but they're really beautiful to stand outside and and gaze into them um do you think there would be similar situations on Mars? Like I know the, the pr air pressure on Mars is very low, but would you get some kind of melt going on under the ice that would carve out these sorts of caverns or maybe in the dry ice? I don't know. It would be interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a big question. I mean, uh, uh, we know that, for example, in Antarctica, there are caves uh, which have been formed through sublimation of ice. So it's, it's, the process is possible uh, even in the, in the ice cap of Mars. Um, and um, and probably there, there are cavities, maybe mm. not huge, but there are cavities even close to the surface uh, when when you have a lot of sublimation because uh, because especially CO2 ice, you know, it's it's very easy to sublimate on, on these these conditions. So yes, I think there are caves on Mars uh, uh, in, in on ice. They probably are not so big. I mean, they are comparable to the terrestrial one, um, but not bigger. Uh, but still, we do not know very, very well because uh, uh, the ice, the ice cap uh, the, on the poles of Mars, uh, we have good images, but it's difficult to see entrances. And we know that there is a quite high porosity, but still, we don't know how much of it is, is caves. But definitely, yes. Also, another uh, interesting thing is about uh, uh, you know, this kind of uh, layers of CO2 ice that uh, are, are seasonal and most probably there are layers that goes away farther than others. So you could have a kind of seasonal case too. That would be really, that would be alien yes, walking through definitely. a carbon dioxide ice cave. Yeah. It's That's something we don't have on Earth, and you would know absolutely. you're on an alien planet when that happens. Well, uh, Francesca, it's absolutely a pleasure to talk to you, and I really appreciate this perspective in space exploration. If people want to follow your work, what is the best place to do that? Um, they can follow, uh, first of all, they use our website for Pangaea and Caves trainings. We have a very good blog. Um, and then uh, for my exploration here on Earth, I suggest to follow the website of the Laventa Association, which I am president, that is organizing most of the projects around the world. It's laventa.it. Uh, and, um, and then I, my social media, I always try to post something on what is going on. That sounds great. Well, we have, you know, we have a few hundred maybe even thousand caves just on my island so and karst mm -hmm. caves so i maybe i'll give it another try yeah yeah of course yeah of you, course. You're, you've yeah. inspired me thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today thank you to you you can also get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter i send it out every friday to more than sixty thousand people i write every word there are no ads and it's absolutely free subscribe at universetoday.com newsletter you can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew M. Gross, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.